Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. A medic trapped in a steel plant surrounded by Russian forces calls for help from Turkey's president. All the while, Russia says it will not use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Hungary says it won't support the EU's ban on Russian oil in its current form. Discussions are underway within the bloc to modify the proposal. Risks of potentially life-threatening side effects caused the FDA to restrict the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The FDA is also studying cases of viral relapse after using Pfizer's pill. Two states led by Republicans are suing the Biden administration. They allege it is pressuring and colluding with big tech to stifle free speech. Ukraine's president says fighting has devastated Ukraine's infrastructure, including medical facilities. He says it's made things difficult for healthcare care workers. NTD's Jessica Beatty has more. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said Thursday that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has devastated hundreds of hospitals and left doctors without drugs or the ability to perform surgery. Even the simplest medications are missing. Russia has brought to Ukraine and Europe such problems that we could have not imagined a few months ago. Over in Mariupol, Zelensky said Russian forces are still shelling the city's Azovstal steel plant. Ukrainian forces and civilians are still there. One man who said he's a medic treating people there asked Turkey's president for help with evacuations. It hurts to see how people die in your arms just because there are not enough antibiotics. My dream is to evacuate all the people, including the military, from the territory of Avastal to stop this horror. NTD is unable to verify the video, which was shared by the founder of the Azov Regiment. It started out as a battalion with neo-Nazi elements after Russian-backed separatists seized parts of the Donbas region in 2014. Kiev says it's been reformed. Russia says destroying the group is one of its key aims. The Pentagon says most of Russia's forces in Mariupol have left, but some remain, like this Russian-backed service member. He says he only wants victory. It's been overextended a bit. Eight years is quite a long time. I wish to end it already. Russia said Friday it will not use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Russia firmly adheres to the principle that there could be no winner in a nuclear war and it must not be released. Meanwhile, the Pentagon Thursday denied reports that the U.S. shared intelligence to target Russian generals earlier this week. We do not provide intelligence on the location of senior military leaders on the battlefield or participate in the targeting decisions of the Ukrainian military. The Ukrainians have, quite frankly, a lot more information than we do. The Pentagon said Ukraine's putting up stiff resistance in the Donbas region, slowing Russian progress. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. First Lady Jill Biden left Washington for a whirlwind tour of Romania and Slovakia. She's there to highlight U.S. commitment to Ukrainian refugees. The wife of President Joe Biden is due to meet U.S. service members and embassy personnel, displaced Ukrainian parents and children, humanitarian aid workers and teachers during the four-day trip. Jill Biden will also meet Romania's first lady, as well as the president of Slovakia. U.S. presidential spouses have little policymaking power, but often serve a soft power role by spreading an administration's message. Over 840,000 Ukrainians have fled to Romania, and over 380,000 have entered Slovakia since the beginning of the war. Most journeyed further to other European countries. Joining the first lady are several other administration officials. Hungary is saying no to the EU's proposal to ban Russian oil. The country is concerned that the plan will hurt its economy. Discussions are underway within the bloc to win over reluctant states. Hungary again said it rejects the EU's plan to stop oil imports from Russia. Prime Minister Viktor Orban told state radio that the country cannot support the new sanctions in their current form. Russian or any type of oil can only arrive via pipeline, which is one end in Russia, the other in Hungary. This is a condition we have. We cannot accept a proposal that ignores this, because this proposal in its current form equals an atomic bomb thrown into the Hungarian economy. Hungary still gets about 65 percent of its oil supply from Russia. Orban said they will need more time and investment to accommodate the transition. 
még ez az egész folyamat lezárul. We know exactly what we need. First of all, we need five years for this whole process to be completed. It is five years. One to one and a half years is not enough for anything. Then we need money to alter the refineries, and we need several trillion forints to alter the Hungarian energy transportation system. But the Prime Minister added that Hungary is ready to negotiate if it sees a new proposal that meets the country's interests. Within the European Commission, talks are underway to modify the original proposal. Previously, most EU countries would have had to stop buying Russian crude oil within six months and to stop importing refined oil products from Russia by the end of the year. Hungary and Slovakia were allowed to make adjustments until the end of 2023. Following the discussions, Hungary and Slovakia could get an extension until the end of 2024 to adapt and the Czech Republic until June 2024. The bloc might also help upgrade the oil infrastructure in these countries, among other changes. Despite the complexity, EU President Ursula von der Leyen says she is confident about the plan's final adoption. EU Foreign Policy Chief Josep Borrell said if no decision is made by the end of this week, talks will continue among foreign ministers next week. Posters accusing famous Swedes of supporting Nazism are appearing on Moscow streets. It's a sign of worsening relations between Russia and Sweden as the Nordic country considers NATO membership. Here's more on that story. Outside the Swedish embassy, two posters affixed to a bus stop feature photographs of Swedish King Gustav V, writer Astrid Lindgren, film director Ingmar Bergman, and IKEA founder Ingvar Kamprad. The message on the poster reads, we are against Nazism, they are not. Commuters at the bus stop in front of the embassy are largely supportive of the campaign. In the current situation, I agree. In this situation, I'm absolutely positive about these posters. The posters indicate worsening relations between Russia and Sweden. If Europeans consider themselves democratic countries, then I think it's entirely democratic to express an alternative point of view and show people differing opinion. Don't show people narrowly focused information that Russians are bad or Russians are the aggressors. Russians are not aggressors. A third poster of the same kind appeared on a major thoroughfare in central Moscow. I have a positive opinion. I'm gladly reading and watching the news, only to glorify our warriors and our homeland. Since the start of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Sweden, as well as its neighbor Finland, have been more seriously considering NATO membership. Sweden's defense minister said last month that a NATO application could trigger a number of responses from Russia, including cyber attacks and hybrid measures such as propaganda campaigns. Russia has repeatedly stated that it aims to denazify Ukraine, a statement that has been dismissed by Kyiv and the West as a pretext to invade. A Ukrainian Holocaust survivor recounts the Nazi invasion of his home country and the horrific fate of much of his family. Now he says he remains determined in the face of the Russian invasion. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more. Yuri Fuchs was five years old when German troops entered Kyiv in September 1941. He didn't expect to witness another war in his lifetime. Until the very last moment, I did not believe that there would be a war. Probably because I had seen war with my own eyes. I had seen the destruction of the post-war country, completely ruined. Only stoves remained in the villages. People lived in dugouts and cooked food on stoves that stood there as monuments of destruction. Fuchs says he still has vivid memories of his grandparents being taken by Nazi police to the Babinyar ravine. Fuchs's mother and sister were later taken by the German police too. Fuchs escaped a similar fate by staying with neighbors who hid him. Ultimately, he ended up at an orphanage. I remember how I cried of hunger because I wanted to eat all the time. Even when I was in an orphanage where food was always available, it wasn't not just me. We would still sneak into the pigsty and steal potatoes from the pigs, potatoes which were boiled and fed to them. The Babinyar massacre marked the start of Ukraine's Holocaust. A pre-war Jewish population of about 1.5 million was virtually wiped out. When Russia started a full-fledged invasion of Ukraine, Fuchs was determined to remain in Kyiv, his hometown. 
You can believe me, I'm not scared anymore, because I'm at that age where all sort of things have happened in my life. When the Germans were here, I was five years old. I was not afraid then, because I could not rationalize and comprehend what was happening. After the war, I had to make my own way and make my own decisions. I raised myself in a way that I have to accept reality. The World War II survivor has great-grandchildren now, and said he's more worried about his family than his own safety. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Authorities in Fiji have seized a super yacht owned by a Russian oligarch at the request of the United States. The U.S. says the oligarch has ties to corruption. The nearly 350-foot foot luxury vessel is worth over $300 million. The DOJ says it was impounded based on probable cause of violating U.S. law, money laundering, and conspiracy. Suleiman Karimov was sanctioned by the United States in 2014 and 2018 in response to Russia's actions in Syria and Ukraine. The billionaire is part of a group of Russian oligarchs who the Justice Department says profits from the Russian government through corruption. Justice Department Task Force Klepto Capture has focused on seizing yachts and other luxury assets to put the finances of oligarchs under strain. It's a bid to pressure the Russian president to end the war in Ukraine. The May 5th seizure was nearly 8,000 miles from Washington. The director of Klepto Capture says this symbolizes the reach and effectiveness of the newly formed task force. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration is restricting the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine due to risk of blood clots. The FDA is also investigating reports of viral relapses following the use of Pfizer's COVID-19 pill. And today's Jeremy Sandberg has more. The FDA said Thursday the Johnson & Johnson vaccine should only be given to adults 18 and over who've had a severe allergic reaction to other vaccines and can't receive another dose. Johnson & Johnson is one of three vaccines used in the U.S. It's a single-shot vaccine using adenovirus technology. The other two are two-dose vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer and use mRNA technology. The agency said the shot could also remain an option for those who refuse to receive mRNA vaccines so they don't go unvaccinated. The plotting risks were first announced last spring, with a Johnson & Johnson shot in the U.S. and a similar vaccine made by AstraZeneca used in other countries. The FDA said then that the benefits outweighed what they considered a rare risk. Warnings about the possibility of blood clots and a rare neurological reaction called Guillain-Barre syndrome were issued. Guillain-Barre syndrome causes muscle weakness and sometimes paralysis. Most people fully recover. In December, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommended Pfizer and Moderna vaccines over Johnson & Johnson because of its safety issues. It is not clear how the new guidelines will be enforced. The FDA is investigating reports of COVID relapses among people who took Pfizer's Paxlovid pill, a treatment for COVID-19. In one report, a 71-year-old man who took the pill had what researchers called a rapid and progressive reduction in the virus, but four days after finishing the treatment course, had a rebound of viral load and symptoms. The report highlights the potential for recurrent, symptomatic virus replication after successful early treatment with the pill. Others have also reported seeing renewed symptoms after taking Paxlovid. The FDA reported that in their evaluation trials run by Pfizer, several participants had rebounds in viral load five to nine days after completing their treatment courses. Pfizer says the rate of rebound in trials was not higher among people who took Paxlovid than in people who took a placebo. Pfizer is required to submit any further information regarding viral rebounds in clinical trials to the FDA as part of the pill's emergency authorization agreement. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Missouri and Louisiana are suing the Biden administration. The Republican-led states allege the administration is pressuring and colluding with big tech companies to suppress free speech. Specifically, they are coming after President Biden, his press secretary, Jen Psaki, Dr. Anthony Fauci, and others. The two states' attorneys general filed the lawsuit, Eric Schmidt of Missouri and Jeff Landry of Louisiana. They filed the case in a district court in Louisiana on April 5th. They made the announcements separately on Thursday. The states claim President Biden worked with social media companies to censor conversations. Those companies are Meta, Twitter, and YouTube. And the conversations include topics from COVID-19 to election integrity to Hunter Biden's laptop. They said the administration did so under the guise of combating misinformation. As for the laptop, an editor at Newsweek says burying the story was journalistic malpractice. But the Washington Post says there was enough doubt about how the information was sourced to justify mainstream news outlets using caution in reporting on it. Here are the other defendants in the lawsuit. 
DHS Secretary Mayorkas, the director of DHS's new Disinformation Governance Board, the Surgeon General, the CDC, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, the Homeland Security Secretary, and the director of the Government Cybersecurity Agency. When A.G. Schmidt made the announcement, he said, free speech is paramount to a healthy society and discourse, debate, and discussion, and has been the cornerstone of our country since the founders codified that right in the Bill of Rights. Schmidt said Americans use social media to discuss many topics. Those include whether masks are effective and whether the virus leaked from the Wuhan lab. Schmidt referenced the totalitarian dystopia in George Orwell's 1984 to make his point. He said the Biden administration is pressuring social media giants to censor speech in what he calls a misguided campaign against misinformation. We contacted the White House for a statement, but haven't heard back yet. The lawsuit goes on to accuse Biden and other government officials of, quote, falsely attacking the laptop story as disinformation right alongside Twitter. The New York Post first published the laptop story in October 2020. It described what was found on the laptop that was abandoned at a repair shop in Delaware. The outlet said it contained compromising pictures and emails of alleged corrupt business deals overseas. Twitter labeled the story as potentially harmful and locked the outlet's account. The platform also stopped users from sharing a link to the story. The Biden administration is reportedly ramping up the use of Title 42 to expel illegal immigrants to Mexico. This while the administration works to end Title 42 later this month. Here are the details. An anonymous U.S. official and an anonymous high-level Mexican official told the Associated Press that the U.S. struck an agreement with Mexico to expel illegal immigrants under Title 42 authority. They say the U.S. border authorities are expelling up to 100 Cubans and 20 Nicaraguans a day from three locations, San Diego, El Paso, and the Rio Grande Valley. The expulsions began April 27th and will end May 22nd. Title 42 is a public health law that's used to expel immigrants to prevent the spread of COVID-19. It is set to expire on May 23rd. Since March 2020, the U.S. has expelled 1.8 million illegal immigrants using Title 42. Border agents are expecting a record wave of illegal immigrants after the law expires. The latest expulsions are reportedly taking place while the Biden administration says it's phasing out the use of Title 42. Both the White House and the Department of Homeland Security have said that Title 42 could no longer be justified on grounds of protecting public health. In an email to NTD, the DHS neither confirmed nor denied the latest expulsions. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. Worries are mounting with Title 42 scheduled to end. What is the administration doing to prepare for the expected influx of illegal immigrants? Here are the details. The Biden administration wants to lift Title 42 in just about two weeks, but are we ready for it? I would not say that we are not prepared. What I would say is that we are preparing. Department of Homeland Security officials are trying to quell fears among lawmakers about the expected surge of illegal immigrants. We are expecting a lot more people to come. At a Wednesday hearing, they cited a six-point vision laid out by DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, which includes shifting manpower, speeding up processing, and issuing deportation orders. These preparations will help us to address the challenges at our border more effectively while protecting the safety and security of our communities. But that wasn't convincing enough, even for some Democrats. As of this moment, I do not feel confident that um, the system is ready. Is that People keep telling me, but we have a plan, and it isn't clear that having the plan and actually having the resources on the ground to meet the goals of that plan are the same thing. Was described, but Republicans, meanwhile, pointed to an already unprecedented level of illegal migration in 2022 and what could be worse after Title 42 ends. What you are saying is that without Title 42, you're going to have a lot more people who come to the border and say, I have a credible fear, and like others, they'll be allowed to come into the country. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that is correct. Okay. And the most heated exchange played out between Senator Josh Hawley and a top border policy official who refused to call the border situation a crisis. But it's not a crisis. It is a challenge, sir. And suggested that the lifting of the public health order will instead decrease illegal border crossing. Because of the lack of oh, wow. consequences. So, de- sure. so eliminating it will, will then, you think, decrease the amount of illegal immigration? I think over time, once we start reimposing significant immigration consequences. Wow, that is news. And the rule still faces an uncertain fate. 
A federal judge has put a hold on its scheduled lifting, and there will be a hearing next week with a final ruling expected. DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas recently met with Mexico's foreign minister. He stressed the United States' whole-of-government approach to prepare the border after Title 42 ends in late May. He also emphasized that the countries in the region must protect their own borders and expel migrants who don't qualify for relief. However, not all lawmakers, including our next guest, are convinced that Secretary Mayorkas is handling the border crisis well. Now we have the pleasure of hearing from U.S. Representative Clay Higgins of Louisiana. Thank you for making the time, Congressman. I'm very happy to be here. It's a crucial time in our nation to discuss these things. Yes, indeed. Now, DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas has recently testified, saying his department has stood as a cornerstone in protecting the homeland by securing the borders, and he recently told CNN that the border is not open. You have called for Mayorkas to resign or face impeachment if the GOP takes the House after the midterms. Can you explain your point of view to us? Yes, sir. Secretary Mayorkas, uh, despite his, his unquestionable service to his nation during the course of his life, he has allowed himself to be used as the instrument of the executive branch to destroy the sovereignty of our nation at the southern border. He has knowingly participated in the Biden administration's policies that have, that have generationally injured our country. He's responsible uh, for the, for the in, incredible increase in uh, overdose deaths in America, the crime wave that's surging across the country. Millions and millions of illegals have crossed into our nation across the southern border, uh, all under the watch of Secretary Mayorkas. So he's to be held accountable for his actions. Therefore, he must be impeached if he's in office. I gave the man fair warning a couple of weeks ago and advised him uh, to resign. We have formally called on him to resign and we have built the case for his impeachment. So where I'm from, I'm a Southern gentleman. You give a fellow fair warning before you knock him out. Congressman, speaking of the executive branch, the Biden administration is reportedly expelling more migrants at the southern border under Title 42 before it expires. This includes a deal with Mexico expelling 100 Cubans and 20 Nicaraguans a day. What do you think this signals? Well, that's a fraction of a fraction of what's crossing, but it's a exactly like the Biden administration uh, to make gestures of, of uh, action and, and pretend that they're, that they're significant enough to address the harm that they've allowed. But it's just a political move. It, 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 certainly the Biden administration has made it very clear that what they consider a successful border management and protection of our sovereignty includes allowing millions and millions of illegal residents and illegal aliens to cross our into our country. So when they, you know, they say that they've increased their percentage of, uh, of deportations and rejections, you're talking about hundreds. Listen, it, there are scores of thousands crossing on, on any given uh, two or three day period at the, at the southern border. Uh, we need extensive action. We have the, the power to do it very fast. We can fix the border. I'm telling you, in two weeks, we can fix the border crisis. If we had an executive branch that was willing to embrace the policies that we developed on the Trump administration over the course of 2017 and 18, by 2019, using the same, the, the same assets we have, same men and women, same boots on the ground, the same 1,954 miles of southern border, the same cartels running Mexico and Central America. We had it under control in 2019. We can do so again with proper leadership out of the executive branch. We do not have that leadership right now. They're accomplishing what they want to do, which is uh, allow a slow invasion of our country of illegal aliens. That's their agenda. Congressman Clay Higgins of Louisiana, thank you so much for your time. Yes, sir, and thank you. We reached out to the Biden administration for a statement on this accusation, but we didn't hear back by airtime. 
Republican Congressman Madison Cawthorn responded to the publication of a nude video of him, claiming it was another hit from his opponent's drip campaign. He vowed to not back down. NTD's Arlene Richards reports. I've never folded in Washington, and I never will. Early voting has begun in the North Carolina GOP primary race, and it seems that the gloves may be off when it comes to embattled Congressman Madison Cawthorn. The American Muckrakers PAC, which runs a website called FireMadison.com, uploaded a video Wednesday that appears to show the congressman naked atop another man, becoming physical and making noises. Cawthorn called the video a new hit against me. He said in a Twitter post that he was being crass with a friend, trying to be funny, and that they were acting foolish and joking. David B. Wheeler, president of Muck Rakers PAC, said in a comment about the video that Madison Cawthorn should resign from Congress today. He said he wasn't interested in Cawthorn's behavior behind closed doors, but that his action should have consequences. Wheeler filed an ethics complaint against the congressman last week claiming improper House financial disclosures regarding gifts and loans to Stephen L. Smith, Cawthorn's scheduler. The next day, the Daily Mail published a video of Cawthorn and Smith sitting in a car and joking about sex. In a video yesterday, Cawthorn addressed what he called outlandish stuff put out by the media. I've really never seen the swamp launch such a coordinated attack against any individual in politics except for Donald Trump. The Republican primaries will take place in North Carolina on May 17. Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. Coming up, the Securities and Exchange Commission has added over 80 Chinese companies to its kickout list, urging them to follow the rules of the U.S. market. And Canadian lawmakers are pushing a new bill that cracks down on forced organ harvesting. That's after an international tribunal condemned Beijing for such crimes. We'll have more for you in just a moment here on NTD News. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. Larry Elder here, and I've got some great news for you. If you're tired of the censorship in this country, then you're in luck. You can go over to epictv.com and watch honest programs that don't spin the facts. EpicTV.com is a brand new, no censorship video platform where you can watch not only my show, but other deep documentaries, great program, wholesome movies that you can watch with your entire family. So head over to EpicTV.com. I'll see you there. NTD's Capital Report. It's about getting answers cutting through the fog of politics. It's about your questions and our chances to ask. What is the net impact of the American Carson Graves? Thank you for joining us. We're speaking to those in power to find out what does this mean for the people. We're here so you are in the know. China's foreign ministry declined to comment after the Asian Games were postponed until 2023 because of the CCP virus. The 19th edition of the event was scheduled to take place from September 10th to the 25th in the capital of Zhejiang province. The multi-sports games are second in size to only the Summer Olympics. The Olympic Council of Asia said in a statement that the organizing committee had been well prepared to deliver the games despite the challenges. It said new dates for the Games would be announced in the near future. 
Organizers said in early April that all 56 competition venues had been completed as the city prepared to host more than 11,000 athletes from 44 nations and territories. China's foreign ministry told reporters when asked about the postponement that they should seek the department in charge, a standard non-answer by Chinese communist officials. Over 80 Chinese companies could be kicked off America's stock market if they continue failing to follow the rules here in the U.S. Here's more. Washington is pushing Chinese companies listed in the U.S. even harder to follow the rules. The Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, added over 80 Chinese companies to a list on Wednesday. Names on that list include some of China's biggest companies, such as e-commerce giant JD.com and video platform Bilibili. If these companies don't open their books to U.S. regulators, they could get kicked out of the U.S. market in three years. The U.S. exchanges have listed about 250 Chinese companies altogether. The value of their total stock shares is over $1 trillion. But here's the catch. Even though Chinese companies should open their books to U.S. regulators, they don't. Beijing doesn't allow them to, citing national security concerns. Despite failing to follow the rules, the U.S. has allowed these Chinese companies to stay here. But in 2020, things changed. Congress passed a bipartisan bill. Under it, Chinese companies that failed to open their books would face delisting in three years. Some Canadian lawmakers are trying to close a loophole, one that allows citizens to get an illegal organ transplant from China. This after an international tribunal says China harvests organs from prisoners of conscience against their will. Here's more. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. A group of Canadian lawmakers is pushing for a new bill. It's a measure that fights the practice of forced organ harvesting. It would make it a criminal offense for a person to go abroad and receive an organ taken without the consent of the person giving the organ. Controversy surrounding transplant tourism has become a backdrop for the measure. That involves when patients travel to other countries to get organs oftentimes because it takes too long to find a match in their home country. In the U.S., for example, it takes about 11 months for a liver and more than three years for a kidney. Right now, over 100,000 Americans are on the waiting list for an organ transplant. Many patients die waiting. But in China, wait time isn't measured in years, but in days and weeks. In 2020, a hospital in Wuhan found four possible heart matches in just 10 days for a female patient. The country has also been known to source organs within 72 hours, or even 24 hours. This information comes from Chinese media reports. In some cases, Chinese hospitals have also promised re-transplants, meaning if the quality of an organ isn't up to par, the surgery would be cancelled the hospital would schedule another transplant within a week. The extremely short wait times have made China one of the top destinations for transplant tourism. But many have been asking a key question. Where do the organs come from? Rights activists argue a major source of China's transplant organs is through forced organ harvesting. Saying China harvests organs from prisoners of conscience by force, sometimes when they're still alive. In 2018, an international tribunal in London gave its judgment on allegations of forced organ harvesting. The tribunal is made up of renowned medical and legal experts. It is beyond doubt that forced harvesting of organs happened on a substantial scale and by state-organized or approved organizations and individuals. Those experts say China's main organ supply comes from Falun Gong practitioners and Uyghurs, members of an ethnic group. Since the allegations have come to light, several countries responded to China's forced organ harvesting. Israel passed a law that prevents insurance reimbursement for illegally obtained organs. Belgium likewise passed a law punishing organ tourism. But in Canada, there is no law that fights organ trafficking which is why the Canadian lawmakers are pushing for this bill. And, and I, too, would like to take this opportunity to recognize the amazing work that was done by the late member of parliament, David Kilgore. On the lawmakers evening. also mentioned the bill is in honor of David Kilgore. He's a former cabinet minister and was among the first that brought the issue to light. 
Back in 2006, when the forced organ harvesting issue first emerged and saw little media coverage, David Kilgore investigated the practice with another rest lawyer named David Mattis. The two later published an investigative report. We pursued every investigative trail we could find. In the report, you will see that there are 18 different avenues of proof and disproof we considered and evaluated. Our bottom line conclusion after considering everything as best we could was that the allegations are true. We believe them to be true, that this uh, harvesting is indeed happening. They were nominated for the 2010 Nobel Peace Prize. Kilgore passed away last week of a rare lung disease. He was 81. It's, uh, it's a shame that he didn't leave, live to see its passage, uh, but I, I certainly hope that this bill will, will pass. Following the investigative report, Kilgore kept raising awareness about the issue. Uh, David Maitis and I have been in about 50 countries talking about it, and we will continue to talk about it, as you, all people of goodwill will, until it stops. Because there's only one country out of, well, I guess, almost 200 countries in the world now that does this on an industrial state-sponsored level, and that's China. What's more, he wrote a book called Bloody Harvest, The Killing of Falun Gong for Their Organs. He is the one that blew the doors open on this practice overseas and that made this thing po possible. Uh, David brought this issue to my attention. He brought this issue to many people's attention. He wrote the initial uh, report along with David Maitis on this issue uh, and has just been a tireless champion on it, but on so many other human rights issues as well. As for the bill, it passed the Canadian Senate last year and is now before the Canadian House of Commons. Still to come, some restaurants in London increasingly look for ways to become more sustainable. One restaurant even offers customers rewards for choosing dishes that are good for the environment. And a number of rock lobster fishermen in Australia work to clean up the industry's environmental impact by developing plastic-free fishing pots. Stay tuned for more after this short break. An unthinkable genocide took the lives of six million Jews and thousands of Jewish survivors are still suffering in poverty today. God calls on people who believe in him to act on his word. Comfort ye, comfort my people. When I come here and I sit with Lily, I realize what she needs right now is food. These elderly Jews are weak and they're sick. They're living on $2 a day, which is impossible. This now is how God's children are living. Take this time to send a survival food box to these forgotten Jews. The International Fellowship of Christians and Jews urgently need your gift of $25 now to help provide one survival food box with all of the essentials they critically need for their diet for one month. When you call right now, your gift's impact will be doubled to help save lives. No vitamins and no protein, so my legs and hands are very weak. Let's make sure that we bring them just a little bit of hope by bringing them a little bit of food. For just $25, you can help supply the essential foods they desperately need for one month. When you call right now, your gift's impact will be doubled to help save lives. For over 35 years, this trusted ministry has given Christians like me a way to tangibly bless Jewish people who are in need throughout the world. God tells us to take care of them, to feed the hungry. And I pray Holocaust survivors will be given the basic needs that they so desperately pray for to survive. Volunteers on bikes are helping to reach Budapest's vulnerable homeless community. They're delivering sandwiches to people living on the streets and providing a friendly ear to listen to their problems and offer advice. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. This food is for Budapest's homeless community. Volunteers meet every Tuesday and Thursday at the school near the Danube River to prepare the snacks. We gather here two times a week with a group of 10-15 volunteers. Most of them are regulars. And 
and we make around 150 and 200 sandwiches at the occasion. But those in need of a meal aren't expected to turn up at the school to collect the sandwiches. Instead, a network of volunteers known as the Budapest Bike Mafia takes the packages. They cycle out onto the streets to find people in need. Some of the uh, people on the streets already know us, so some of them are expecting us every day. There are also a lot of them who are like, oh yes, I've heard about you, you are the bikers. The volunteers pedal to areas frequented by homeless people to give out the sandwiches. Yeah. But it's the social connection that helps the homeless too. Obviously, if they receive a uh, cup of hot tea or a sandwich, it really helps them throughout the day. But the fact that they can talk with somebody for a few minutes, it also, uh, it also a big help for them. It's an act of charity that homeless man Peter Varadi says he appreciates. And he agrees that it's about more than just getting some food to eat. They are not just here for the half minute when they give you the sandwich. I can see they are really curious about what happened to me that day or what happened to us all week. They listen, they talk to us, and that alone is a very big help for a person who lives on the street and nobody talks to him. The Budapest Bike Mafia plans to keep up its deliveries. The organization has also expanded to develop numerous additional programs, including outreach to children, sustainability, urban gardening, and photography for homeless people. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. From foraging wild ingredients to using scraps to reduce food waste, some restaurants in London are increasingly seeking ways to become more sustainable. And one restaurant even offers customers rewards for choosing dishes that are good for the planet. Called Native, this restaurant is focusing on reducing food waste for its dishes and even its cocktails. Along with chef and co-founder Ivan Tisdall Downs, Imogen Davis launched this restaurant in Mayfair a year ago. The idea of Native was that we really wanted to, to shout about wild food, about the food that we have readily available, even from like a short walk from work to the train station. Like there's so much wild food out there that we can be eating. Native's menu is based on seasonal ingredients with a focus on regenerative agriculture. So even here in the centre of Mayfair, we've got a beautiful, huge, big cherry, cherry blossom tree, which has inspired one of the dishes. And um, we make a wonderful ajo blanco with that. It's like a cold gazpacho. Um, and hopefully it'll be on the menu in a couple of weeks. Down the road, Miscusi has been named the second B Corp restaurant in the country, a certificate given to for-profit companies meeting high standards of social and environmental performance. So as a B Corp company, the second one in Italy and apparently the second one in UK as well, we're really proud of it. Um, we keep an eye on the waste and uh, also the gas emission that comes from the food system. All of Miscusi's dishes follow the United Nations guidance that aims to combat climate change by lowering carbon emissions. So all our plates are following already the UN planetary boundaries and we are really trying to cut the em emission of CO2 and we are actually already in line with that because uh, almost all our dishes are minus 50% of the um, uh, emits that we want to achieve by 2030. Muscusi gets its customers involved in its climate mission too with its loyalty program. If they opt for one of the five pasta plates with the lowest carbon footprint, they earn double points to spend in the restaurant on their next visit. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. A group of rock lobster fishermen in Australia are working to clean up the ocean. They're aiming to reduce the fishing industry's environmental footprint by developing plastic-free fishing pots. Before first light in Australia, Gary Ryan heads off to work. For 30 years, he's been catching and selling Victoria's lucrative rock lobster, until his operation hit something of an environmental snag. We just didn't realise, like lots of things, you don't realise there's a problem until a certain amount of time goes by and you realise, shit, there's this problem we've caused and we didn't, we didn't mean to. That problem has to do with his fishing pots. Lost or abandoned fishing gear is considered the deadly... Catch us more. And uh, I'm, I can't put my hand on my heart and promise you they catch more but I don't think they're any worse. Among the main pollution offenders are red plastic lobster pot necks, commonly used by fishermen across Victoria. But fishermen were largely unaware of their impact on the ocean. No one's really tried to make a plastic-free net in the neck or lobster pot in the past because I'd, 
It's probably because no one's had the headspace because no one was aware of the problem. Broken lobster pot necks showed up often out of the more than 1,000 pounds of trash Colleen Houston picked up earlier this year. She and her husband Luke spent seven days collecting debris on their journey, laying the foundation for change in the lobster trade. The response of local fishermen uh, Gary Ryan, he's changing over all his pots, moving the plastic out of them, getting rid of those, um, you know, the red necks that seem to break up. Ryan is one of six fishermen in Victoria trying to craft the perfect plastic-free lobster pot, a trial that's received support from the state's fishing body, Fisheries Victoria. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And the World Cup trophy tours in the lead up to matches. Fans had a chance to get up close to it in the countdown as Qatar prepares to host the games. Find out more here on NTD News. A rare diamond and ruby ring, an important collection of watches, and other treasures will go under the hammer next week in Switzerland. That's according to auction house Sotheby's. Let's take a look. This stunning ring by Chopar features an 80-carat diamond. It'll be up for auction on May 10th in Geneva and is expected to fetch around $8 million. It's mounted with six uh, very bright uh, rubies, uh, unheated Mozambique rubies, and it's a D-color stone, uh, internally flawless, potentially flawless, uh, excellent cut and symmetry. It's also Olivier Wagner is the head of sale and jewelry specialist at Sotheby's Geneva. He says diamond prices have increased on average close to 15 percent since the beginning of the year. Sotheby's is also presenting a diamond bracelet from 1927 decorated with tropical birds and floral sprigs that could fetch $745,000. It's really a museum piece. Each stone was specifically cut to fit the mount, so the, the, the work to, uh, to, to make this bracelet is really uh, amazing and it will be very costly and uh, will take a lot of time to uh, replicate that uh, even today. The auction house is also offering an important collection of watches which in total could fetch $18 million, the highest collective value held by Sotheby's in nearly 10 years. One of the highlights is an Audemars Piguet Royal Oak, designed by Gerald Genta, known as the Picasso of watchmaking. This one is actually the one that was sold to Genta himself and worn by Genta um, during his lifetime in 78. Um, it's particularly special because it's the only one that was actually owned by him that's ever come to, to market as of yet. Other notable items include a 1979 Patek Philippe Jumbo Nautilus wristwatch. Do you remember when a great night's sleep meant the next day's activities went like a breeze? And that was a long time ago? Here's Gina Marie who brings us Strong Mind and Body. How long is it since you had a pure sleep? I'm talking about a deep quality sleep without the need for drugs. When quality sleep improves, you will wake up more easily. Your stamina will also improve. You may also need less sleep at night. Let's look at 10 tips to help get that deep, restful, restorative sleep. Number one, don't go to sleep on a full stomach. Your body needs energy to digest the meal. So if you go to sleep on a full stomach, expect poor digestion. Number two, no alcohol, caffeine, or artificial stimulants. If you decide to drink, expect low energy levels and poor sleep at night. Alcohol might help sleep come sooner, but you may wake up too early. Also, artificial stimulants may affect your adrenal glands. Number three, exercise. Exercising during the day leads to sleeping soundly at night. Number four, eat a healthy diet. It really works. Your body will thank you for it. You'll lose weight, feel better, and get more shut eye. Number five, get more sunlight. Your body needs sunlight to make vitamin D. So try to get a bit of sun on your bare skin. This can increase energy and elevate your mood. Number six, are you sleeping in the dark? Night workers need a dark room while day sleeping. Get blackout shades or curtains. Number seven, is your bed comfortable? 
Don't skimp on sheet quality, it feels good on your skin. Also, pay attention to pillows. They should cradle your head, not raise it. Your spine should lie straight. In terms of your mattress, your body needs even support, so no lumps or dips. Number eight, make your bed organic. Aim for all natural materials. Your skin needs to breathe. Synthetic fibers are not the best. Number nine, stop snoring. Overweight people tend to snore more. The skin decreases airflow and wakefulness occurs. And number 10, is your house too dry? Do you have a sore throat, dry nose or nosebleeds? If so, a humidifier may be the answer. Aim to change the water daily. With just 200 days until the start of the FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022, the famous World Cup trophy is on tour. Fans and families snapped pics and selfies next to the trophy. The trophy is touring Qatar during the Eid holiday from May 5th until the 10th. It will pop up in different tourist hotspots to mark the 200-day countdown to the World Cup finals. Qatar will host the first ever World Cup in the Middle East. The Gulf state is also the smallest country to have held soccer's biggest event. Fans from 32 competing nations are set to watch games at eight stadiums clustered around the capital city, Doha. The small size means supporters will be able to easily reach all the venues, raising the possibility of watching more than one match in a day. This contrasts with recent tournaments in Russia and Brazil, where flights were often needed to travel to each venue city. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to put our email on screen. We'd love to hear from you. Until next time, Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.